Well, guys, um, welcome to the 1980s presentation. I hope you guys enjoy uh, this presentation, and I hope you liked the 70s one. I hope you like the ones going forward. But let me just say that the 1980s, to me, was just a magical decade. And I always joke with people and say, you know, if you if you didn't get a chance to grow up in the 80s, you kind of got cheated. You kind of you kind of got robbed. But I mean, it's like you say, it's joking. But I look back on the 80s as just this kind of magical time. Now I don't know if everybody that lived through it looks like you know looks back at it like that. Uh, they probably don't. But for me, it was when I was growing up, and there was just I don't know. It seemed like America was just a great place to to be. Um, it was kind of going through a transitional period at this time. So many new things, exciting things were happening. And of course I was growing up. So we always kind of look back on our childhood years differently than we do, you know, as we get older. But for me, it was a time of, I don't know, it was just carefree. And I look back on it with definitely a, a deep sense of nostalgia. I wish I was back in the eighties in a lot of ways. And, uh, you know, so I hope you guys can kind of feel that as I go through this presentation, but it was an awesome time to be alive. It was so fun. And anyway, so here's the 80s. All right, let's get going here. We'll just take it year by year like we did with the 1970s presentation. And uh, let's start, of course, in 1980. Uh, in, in that era, the Olympics the winter and summer were both held in the same year. They're not that way anymore. They're staggered now. Uh, so nowadays you have, you know, like summer Olympics, for example, would be like this year. And then winter Olympics would be in two years. And the summer Olympics would be two years after that. And so every two years, there's some kind of Olympics now. It didn't used to be that way. We used to have the winter Olympics. For example, in 1980, we had the winter Olympics in February. Uh, and they happen to be here in our country, in uh, up in uh, Lake Placid, New York. And then later that summer in 1980, like in July, you'd have the Summer Olympics. Well, the Summer Olympics in 1980 happened to be in Moscow, Russia. And we were upset with the Soviets for how they had handled some political things, including going into Afghanistan. And uh, so we decided to boycott. We did not go to their Olympics uh, for the summer. Uh, Post-it notes were introduced, and that's kind of just a fun side note, but how many millions and hundreds of millions of those things have been sold? Uh, CNN becomes the first all-news cable station, round-the-clock news, and of course uh, there were, would be other stations that would that would start in the aftermath of this. And so even today, you, you know, I'm sure you guys love it as teenagers, right, who doesn't tune in to a good cable news network and just watch it for hours on end, right? But um, some people do. So, but yeah, that's that's when kind of the, the cable news thing started. The world is shocked when John Lennon, former star, uh, one of the Fab Four uh, in the Beatles music group is assassinated outside his New York City apartment. And so, uh, you know, of course, fans of the Beatles and fans of John Lennon were in, in mourning uh, as a result of this. Ronald Reagan is elected president, and uh, he gets elected, uh, he beats Jimmy Carter, who was running for re-election in the election of 1980, and Reagan uh, gets elected and will be sworn in uh, in January of 1981. And then Mount St. Helens erupts in Washington State, my home state. It was about 250 miles or so away from where I lived, uh, but this was this was huge. This was a volcano that people had been warning was going to erupt for, you know, years, and it finally did. And it was craziness. Uh, ash all over the place. Um, in fact, ash even reached all the way back to the East Coast, and we'll talk about that in more in just a minute. But yeah, it was, that was probably one of the earliest memories I have. Was, uh, I was three years old, and uh, three, you know, you don't usually remember a whole lot from when you were three, but this was so remarkable that um, I do remember certain aspects of this. And then our U.S. hockey team beat Russia in the Winter Olympics in, in early 1980 uh, in Lake Placid, New York. And this was one of the great upsets in sports history. They made a movie about this. It's, the movie's called Miracle. The incident itself was known as the Miracle on Ice because we had on our U.S. team a bunch of college uh, players 
and we were playing against the, the Soviets who had a bunch of professionals and had played together for a decade and, and were probably the best team in the world. And uh, the Soviets had won, I believe it was the previous four uh, Olympic gold medals in ice hockey. And of course, everybody thought they would win in 1980. And the U.S. pulls off, you know, this just monumental upset. It was awesome. So that is what happens in 1980. Now let's look at a few of the pictures. Like I said, Ronald Reagan, elected president. And Reagan had been an actor and uh, a radio personality, a sports broadcaster. He, he was well known. Uh, he, was, he had been a governor as well. And so uh, he was kind of what America needed in 1980. We were, we were down on our luck a little bit as the 70s came to a close. And so that we needed another kind of, you know, another boost. And uh, it was kind of similar in a way, like we talked about to the late 50s how we needed a boost in the election of 1960, and, and JFK gave us that to a large degree. Well, Reagan did the same thing in 1980, so uh, he was good for this country. Here is Mount St. Helens erupting over by Seattle, uh, and like I said, it's one of my probably earliest memories. I was only three years old, but I remember this because so much ash uh, and debris was blown out of that volcano and it went everywhere. Now, in Spokane, where I grew up, we were only 250 miles or so away. And so I just remember the skies were dark, you know, all the ash was blocking out the sun. Uh, the ash would fall, you know, all over Spokane. I mean, it was like, it was like uh, you had to shovel it, almost like snow, but it was heavy. Uh, it, it was just a mess. It was everywhere. And we, a lot of us would wear those, you know, those surgical masks and stuff to, to keep from breathing in the ash and the fumes and whatever. And, and, uh, the ash went as far as Washington, DC and to the East coast, all the, you know, all the way from Seattle. So this was a, a very memorable event. And here is the U S hockey team. The Miracle on Ice, they called it. And like I said, the movie Miracle is about this event. So, uh, yeah, this is what an amazing, an amazing uh, win this was for the Americans. This was actually, when we beat the Soviets, it was actually basically the semifinals. And uh, we still had to win one more game to win the gold medal, which we did. So, but this, this is, event goes down as the, probably the greatest upset in sports history. Nineteen eighty-one, the first launch of the space shuttle. Uh, we had previously sent astronauts up in in rockets, and then had uh, kind of uh, capsules that they could uh, detach, in, you know, or detach from the rocket in and and land in the you know in the ocean or or they you know we had, basically we didn't have a thing like the space shuttle until nineteen eighty-one. Space Shuttle was just an all-encompassing uh, enclosed area, enclosed basically almost vehicle, right, to take astronauts to space, and and they would live in there and and uh, and explore. Okay. Uh, in also 1981, the first female Supreme Court justice, Sandra Day O'Connor, is appointed to the Supreme Court. Prince Charles and Princess Diana get married. Prince Charles is the son. Of Queen Elizabeth II, and he married Diana, and uh, we'll talk about that a little more in detail in just a minute. MTV also uh, starts in 1981. MTV Music Television, and that revolutionized uh, music on TV. It was because of MTV that all the musicians started making music videos for their most popular songs, and MTV was ex out of this world popular for most of the 1980s, probably all of the 1980s. And then Pac-Man comes to the United States. Pac-Man uh, wasn't the first video game, but it was probably the biggest, most popular video, video game up to uh, its time, and it revolutionized video games. Developed over in Japan uh, and brought here, it was 
uh, it was quite quite the rage uh, for for every kid, I think, and most adults as well. So here's Prince Charles and Princess Diana. Uh, even though Prince Charles was the you know royalty born into royalty, Princess Diana was the one that captured the hearts of the English people and the world. Princess Diana was, uh, from what we can tell, just a, a super nice lady, very charitable, uh, a really big humanitarian, and she would just had this style and this grace about her that the people fell in love with her. They didn't care much for Prince Charles, but they loved Princess Diana. There's MTV. And like I said, music videos then became the thing. And so people would tune into MTV to watch music videos of all their favorite musicians. And then it became kind of a thing of who could make the, be the best music video, who could make the most innovative, cutting-edge music video to go along with their songs. And, you know, in some ways it was pretty cool, and in some ways it might have uh, uh, affected the music a little bit. Who knows? But it was, it was pretty awesome. Uh, in the old days. And MTV is still on, but they don't really show music videos anymore. Uh, they have reality shows and all kinds of different stuff, but the music videos is what MTV really started on, and that's how it gained its base. And uh, the, the 80s was all about MTV and music videos. And then Pac-Man. Like I said, this was what everybody was playing. You used to play it at the arcades. They used to have, you know, uh, basically businesses that had big arcade machines and you would go and pay to play. Uh, of course, then it came out on the original, kind of the, the big selling console of the early 80s, which was uh, Atari. And uh, if you had an Atari and you bought the game Pac-Man, then you could play it as much as you wanted at your own house. So um, I remember we had an Atari when I was little and we played Pong and we played Pac-Man and and other you know other games like Donkey Kong and so forth and and that was uh, definitely an essential part of my childhood no doubt so good stuff in 1982 Michael Jackson's Thriller album is released and it becomes the biggest selling album of all time uh, it sold 20 million copies and it just it was a revolutionary moment if you will uh in music and so michael jackson of course was like we just talked about mtv michael jackson's music videos became the must see his music videos were you know in depth and and they were uh they were works of art uh you know as far as a lot of people were concerned and and but his but michael jackson had taken the music world by storm in such a way that we had not seen probably since Elvis and the Beatles. And so uh, Michael Jackson's, in any album he came out with sold like crazy, but Thriller became the biggest selling album. The Vietnam War Memorial is built in Washington, DC to remember the Vietnam veterans. And uh, I addressed this in our Vietnam um, PowerPoint you know, presentation, but when this is built, it is, it's an appropriate, way to memorialize the Vietnam vet. And uh, it's still one of the most widely visited monuments and attractions in Washington, DC. And then look at that at the bottom there. The first ever artificial heart transplant is performed. What a miracle this is, that they could take an artificial heart and put it into a human being and keep them alive, right? So it gives hope for people that have failing hearts and, and uh, it gives them a, a you know something to believe in that you know, they can continue their life. So this was a miracle, really in and of itself. So that's 1982. Of course, here's Michael Jackson, and what that's what the Thriller album looks like. Uh, and this was it just it changed everything as far as music went. And every other musician was trying to, you know be Michael Jackson, live up to Michael Jackson's status and popularity. And of course, nobody could do it, but uh, Michael Jackson certainly changed the music industry.
And here's the Vietnam War Memorial. And that wall is something to see, no doubt about it. it is, it's absolutely amazing and very humbling to stand in front of. In 1983, Cabbage Patch Kids are introduced. I'll show you a picture of them in a minute, but oh, this was the thing that every kid had to have, every girl especially, and you know, a lot of guys too, but this was the toy, the doll to have, and who knows how much money was made off Cabbage Patch Kids, but it, uh, it made somebody and probably multiple people, very wealthy. Uh, the Just Say No to Drugs campaign becomes popular. This was uh, President Reagan's wife, Nancy. It's kind of her crusade, and uh, the illegal drug problem in this country, of course, was advertised all over the place, on the news and everywhere, and how bad it was. And, and so Nancy Reagan uh, came up with this campaign, Just Say No, Just Say No to Drugs. The personal camcorder, is introduced. Now there had been, uh, you know, personal video cameras before this. They were usually the, what was called the Super 8 video camera, which was black and white and no sound and sometimes kind of grainy footage. And the personal camcorder though in 1983 is introduced that is, is uh, allows for sound and it's color and uh, the, the picture is a little better, not like today, but a little better than it had been. And some of the original camcorders would be big enough, and they were big, uh, but they'd be big enough to be able to hold a full-size VHS tape in them. And so you could just tape the, you know, the footage on the VHS and then take it out of there and, and pop it right into your uh, VCR and you could watch it right there. So that was like all the rage as well. People thought that was so cool. Of course, we've come a long way since then in, in the technology, but that's what it was. And then one of the most popular TV shows of all time, MASH, uh, had its final episode in 1983. Of course, they've put reruns on TV since 1983, basically, but, but in, in 1983, the final episode uh, was on TV, and uh, it was the most watched TV show ever to that point. MASH was basically a comedy about a MASH unit, a medical unit, during the Korean War. And uh, it was extremely popular, it still is. And of course, uh, if you talk to people who grew up watching MASH, for most of them, it was one of their favorites, if not their favorite TV show. And then CDs are released, compact discs. Now, they didn't become really widespread until probably the late 80s and early 90s, but they're released as a new technology. And so uh, CDs eventually will revolutionize music because before that you had eight tracks, they were called, and then and cassette tapes. And uh, CDs allow you to fast forward instantly to the next song or, re or, or go back to the last song. And you didn't have to, uh, uh, like on a cassette tape, you had to try to fast forward or, or rewind and just guess, you know, where the right spot was you wanted to to listen to, you know, and, and, and so CDs make it much easier. The sound is, is more crisp and, and more clear. And, uh, they definitely, this definitely changes the music world. Here are Cabbage Patch Kids. Uh, they, my sister, I think had two or three of them. I mean, this is what every kid wanted. It was crazy. And you can see everyone was unique and, and, <laughs> I don't know, kind of, kind of crazy looking, I guess, but, but uh, they, they were the thing to have, and they were not cheap, and uh, so whoever made these was making a ton of money, but it, it was crazy. But yeah, you, you find something that the masses want, you find something that is, is in demand, even for a short time, and uh, you'll be doing just fine financially, right? So, and the cabbage patch makers found that out in a hurry. And then here is MASH, uh, the cast of MASH, and, and that's uh, on the bottom left there. That's a picture you would see as kind of a, a part of the introductory song to the show. And, and uh, it, you know, it has been surpassed since then in, uh, you know, as far as popular shows go and amount of people that watch. But for its day, the last episode of MASH that aired on TV was the most watched television show up to that point.
in, in uh, TV history. So that's quite an accomplishment. All right, 1984 was a big year. The Cosby Show premiered, and the Cosby Show would eventually become the most watched and loved TV show of its time. Uh, it was it starred Bill Cosby. It was based on his comedy, and uh, it was about a an all black family. Bill Cosby was the dad, and they were in Philadelphia. He was a prominent doctor, and it was one of the first TV shows uh, sitcoms to have an all black family. Them be the stars of the show, and uh, and just kind of about their life. They had uh, in the show a handful of kids, and and it was it was just about their adventures. And it was the show to watch. It was on Thursday nights. I remember that very distinctly. And if you were out and about on a Thursday night when the Cosby Show was on, people thought there was something wrong with you. Uh, you know, because <laughs> why, why aren't you home watching the Cosby Show? I mean, people would schedule their lives around this. And this is before DVR. And so, you know, you had to be home to watch a show when it was on. And, uh, and people did not want to miss the Cosby Show. Also, the Summer Olympics happened in 1984, and they were here in the United States. Remember, the 1980 Olympics, Summer Olympics, had been in Russia, and we had not, uh, we had not gone. We had boycotted, and then the the Soviets boycott our Olympics in 1984 in Los Angeles. Uh, the AIDS virus is discovered, and that becomes very frightening for people uh, because they don't quite know much about it. And uh, and the media hypes it, and, and there's a lot of misinformation out there about it, uh, similar to what is happening with the coronavirus and COVID-19. And uh, so the AIDS virus, much has been learned about it since then. A lot of the information, uh, you know, correct, viable information has been learned and uh, disseminated. And so the AIDS virus is, yes, it's, it's a really bad thing. It's a sad thing, but uh, it, uh, you know, it is understood much better nowadays. Uh, the first infomercials on TV, and who doesn't love a good infomercial? The infomercial is basically one big long commercial for a product, right? And usually these infomercials would uh, go anywhere from anywhere uh, to you know, 30 minutes to an hour. And it seems like nowadays a lot of Saturday morning TV is infomercials, but um, the infomercials were meant to sell products, and uh, of course anything from blenders to who knows what, and must have been successful because they've kept them on TV, so people must be buying the stuff. Uh, Run DMC, the first rap group to have a certified gold album, which means uh, a gold album is you sell at least 500,000 copies of the album. Run DMC becomes groundbreaking in the rap industry. And then Apple Computers releases the Macintosh personal computer, the Mac. And this allows, uh, of course, people to have a computer in their own home. They were very expensive in 1984. Not many people bought them yet. Not, pe not many people knew how to work a computer. I knew how they didn't know anything about computers. And there's, you know, still still the older generation today, some, some of them fall into that category. But the younger generation, of course, has all grown up around computers and the technology. So, you know, people are very familiar with it and, and comfortable with it. But uh, in 1984, when the Mac is released, that becomes the new hot thing, uh, you know, in the technology world. But uh, it would be a number of years before the average person would have a, a computer in their own home. So here is a picture of uh, the Cosby Show, the family, and uh, like I said, this was the show to watch. If you were not watching it, uh, what was wrong with you, right? So there's Bill Cosby on the right and, his, and the TV family on the left. And then here is the Mac. In 1984, you can see the monitor, and the monitor had a space in it. You can see a little hole in it. Yeah, that was for the floppy disk to put in to save information. You can see the, how the keyboard looked and the big blocky mouse. Uh, but yeah, we kind of laugh and say, man, are you kidding me? That's what computers looked like? Yeah, that's what they looked like. You can So you can see how much progress has been made since then. In 
1985, the Nintendo gaming system is released, and this will now revolutionize video games. Uh, the console system that most people had before this was called Atari, and uh, the Atari was what they call an 8-bit system. The Nintendo now revolution, revolutionizes that, and the graphics are going to be better, and the games are going to be better, and they're more, you know, they're just... Uh, Nintendo changes video gaming. Of course, it wouldn't be long until other, you know, consoles come out and uh, and improve upon the original Nintendo. But uh, I remember when I got a, a Nintendo, probably about 1987 eight, or 1988 uh, for Christmas. That was still one of the greatest Christmas presents I ever got. But uh, the yeah, the Nintendo gaming system changes uh, personal video gaming. Uh, that's for sure. And the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is opened in 1985 in Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, definitely on my bucket list, I would love to go to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. There's the Nintendo system, the NES, they called it. And that's what the controllers looked like. And of course, Super Mario Brothers was among the most popular games on Nintendo. And, and, uh, Still is a classic, if you ask me. And here's the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland. Like I said, uh, who, who doesn't want to go there, right? All the memorabilia and all the, all the cool things to see from rock and roll history. Uh, there's so much there, and I definitely want to see that someday. In 1986, uh... The space shuttle called Challenger went up into the sky and it was going to be this glorious day because um, it had a couple women astronauts on board, and including one who had been a school teacher. And uh, she trained to be an astronaut and, and was chosen to go on this mission. And, and uh, they, they went up into the sky. Everybody was watching. It was on TV. Uh, kids around the country were watching, you know, on TV at school because you know, a teacher was up in, you know, with the other astronauts and the mission didn't get very far up and it ended in tragedy. The space shuttle exploded, burst into a, just a huge ball of fire and all the astronauts on board uh, died. And so this, this was shocking, right? Because we thought that we kind of had the, you know, we kind of had this stuff down by now. We, we knew how to build spacecraft that would not explode and we you know we, we thought we were you know kind of past that stage of of uh these tragedies and and i guess not but uh yeah, it was quite a thing uh halley's comet is is seen uh, it's not seen very often uh so when it when it comes around and it's seen it's it's a big deal uh the statue of liberty's 100th birthday uh and and so uh, that's, that was kind of a that was cause for celebration, right? Lady Liberty's birthday. The Oprah Winfrey Show starts as an afternoon talk show. Oprah Winfrey will become uh, the most popular uh, talk show host in you know of, of afternoon TV. And of course, she's gone on to uh, to international fame for that, and has gotten into other industries as well. But but yeah, her talk show was. Uh, was a was must see for a lot of people as well, and then the uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Day is celebrated for the first time. Uh, King was assassinated in 1968, and then in 1986, uh, they formally create a federal holiday known as Martin Luther King Jr. Day, and so uh, we still get that day off of school. It's it's a, still a federal holiday. All the federal buildings and post office and everything is closed that you know on that day and. And so uh, that's the day it's from, that's the year, 1986, that it's first recognized. Here's a picture of the, the, uh, the Challenger blowing up. That was just an unthinkable sight, you know, for people that were watching this. It was crazy. And then there is the, uh, the crew on the left. And... Tragically, all of them are lost. And then the Statue of Liberty. 
New York Harbor, right? And uh, we talked about we've talked about the Statue of Liberty quite a bit this year, but uh, kind of interesting fact is that the pedestal the statue is built on is actually just a little taller than the statue itself. So uh, most people don't think about that, but they built the pedestal obviously so the statue could be seen from much further distances as uh, as people approach New York. So, but it's 100th birthday in 1986. In 1987, one of the most bizarre and crazy things of the whole 1980s happened in this country, and it ended. Uh, it ended well. This was this was a story that ended in in rescue, and it ended in triumph and not tragedy. Fortunately, uh, there was a little girl. Uh, they called her Baby Jessica, and she uh, fell down a well. She was only a year and a half old. She was in her aunt's backyard in Texas in October of 1987. And she fell down a well that her aunt had in the backyard. And she was down there for 58 hours. Uh, so, you know, almost two and a half days. And rescuers uh, were trying to get at her and... Uh, and for 58 hours, America was glued to the TV. Of course, as news stations were covering this round the clock. And finally, after 58 hours, rescuers freed her from the eight inch well casing. If you can believe that, how she fit into there. And she was 22 feet below the ground. And they got her out of there. And she became uh, not only a national, but an international hero, right? An international star. Uh, and she was just, just a little, you know, year and a half old little toddler. Um, but this was on every news station. It was on every in every magazine, on every newspaper. And uh, of course, it becomes, you know, it, be, it, it was the talk, not just for those 58 hours, but for quite a while after. And I'll show you a picture of, of her and, and kind of uh, of the incident in just a second. But uh, also in 1987, the world population reaches 5 billion and as we're talking here today in 2020, uh, they estimate that it's over 7 billion, upwards of 7.5 billion. So we've, we've continued to grow like crazy. But uh, yeah, the world population hit 5 billion in 1987. And then there is baby Jessica on the left and the right. Um, but... Uh, but that's what she looked like when they pulled her out of the well. Uh, and what a crazy incident this was. I mean, just, you know, it was traumatic. And then, but fortunately, it ended in a happy way. Um, you can see on the right there, Peep, the People magazine, uh, Baby Jessica, one year later, convinced she was rescued by Grandma and Winnie the Pooh. She's happy, healthy, and rich, while her parents in their Texas town have learned painful lessons about gossip and greed. So, of course, you know, you, you're going to get some crazy stories written in, in some of these magazines and stuff, but I imagine her life and her family's life was a little crazy in the aftermath of this uh, because the event itself was crazy. So anyway, you could do more research on any of these things, you know, if you're interested, but that's what happened with baby Jessica. In 1988, CDs outsell vinyl records for the first time ever. People were still buying vinyl records back in the 80s. Uh, of course, cassette tapes, like I said, were, uh, you know, selling uh, like crazy as well. But CDs had started in the early, kind of early 80s, early to mid, and then we had talked about that. And then by the late 80s, people are buying CDs because they're easier than cassette tapes to, you know, to maneuver. And, um, and they're smaller than vinyl. And, you know, and so, you know, everybody has their favorite. I'll still listen to a, a, a vinyl record. I have tons of them. I still listen to vinyl records. And, you know, there's something about that sound. Uh, and, you know, cassette tapes, just for nostalgic purposes, are kind of interesting to flip into, you know, a player and, and play. But CDs are just so much easier and and so and convenient. So CDs became, you know, in 19, in, by 1988, they were outselling the records. And, of course, into the 90s, into the 2000s. Uh, CDs continue to sell 
uh, had huge numbers. And then, of course, now we have uh, the technology to play our music through an, you know, MP3 systems and other, and other things and on our phones. It just, you know, we've streamlined it even more. So things always change. That's one thing about technology is that it seems like it's never stagnant. Uh, it's always, it's always changing for better or worse. It's always changing. Also in 1988, the world's longest undersea tunnel, it's called the Chunnel begins to be built between England and France. It's 23 and a half miles long. To me, this is crazy. This is one of the most miraculous, you know, uh, modern marvels that we have in, in technology. Uh, they built a, an underwater tunnel between France and England so people can drive between the two countries. 23 and a half miles long. The countries are close together. Uh, but 23 and a half miles of underwater tunnel. And I'll show you a picture of it in a minute, but it, it crazy, right? That somebody can get in their car and drive from England to France or from France to England. And, uh, you know, forever, people would have to take a, a boat or eventually an airplane uh, across, but no longer do you have to do that. And then George Bush Sr. is elected as U.S. president in 1988. Here is a picture of the channel. They call it the the English Channel Tunnel. So it's the the Channel Tunnel becomes the channel, and uh, kind of a funny name, but that's how they got the name. And like I said, it connects England and France. Pretty awesome. So I can only imagine the guys who built this. Very dangerous to do underwater welding and and underwater construction like that. But talk about a a miracle of modern technology. This is it. And here's a picture of George Bush Sr. He was elected in 1988. He had been Ronald Reagan's vice president, and now he gets elected as president. So uh, he transitions from VP to president, and he is sworn in in January of 1989. And he will serve until January of 1993. Wow, 1989, this was some way to end the decade of the 80s. And uh, let's just go over it. The Berlin Wall comes down in Berlin, Germany. Uh, since 1961, the Berlin Wall had been up, separating families and friends in that city of Berlin. Uh, of course, the Soviets controlled the East, the Americans controlled the Western part. Uh, and it was just, a, you know, the, the Cold War, was symbolized by the Berlin Wall. And so when the Berlin Wall starts, finally comes down and East and West Berlin are reunited, it's a huge victory for democracy and for freedom and for opportunity. And it's a, it's a, you know, a death blow to communism because now Americans can say, hey, see, look, our republic and our democratic ideas that we preach and that we believe in, they're so much better and we're vindicated by this. We're, we're showing you that the Berlin Wall is coming down. The Cold War, the next one you can see, ends. Uh, communism in the Soviet Union crumbles. And we're, we see this as a major victory and a vindication for democracy and for freedom and, uh, and for the ideas of liberty and, and justice that, that, we, that we believe in. And so, uh, you know, there is no perfect system in the world, and, and far from it. But we've always believed that our system is the best and people have more freedom and opportunity here than anywhere else. And uh, that the communist ideas just keep people down and are brutal and are oppressive. And so when the Berlin Wall comes down, when Soviet Union crumbles, when the Cold War ends, we see this as a major victory for our way of life. Uh, and to further prove that point, what happened in China that year uh, shocks the world. China, being a communist nation, uh, you know, does not give its people freedom of speech and the right to assemble peacefully and, 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 and all these things. And so, and so uh, when students protested in Tiananmen Square in Beijing, China, uh, the Chinese military 
just couldn't allow that to happen. These, these students were just protesting for more basic freedoms. They wanted freedom of speech. They wanted the right to assemble. They wanted, they wanted freedoms and, and opportunities that they didn't currently have. And the Chinese government uh, sent in its military and thousands end up dying at the hands of the Chinese military. The soldiers roll in in their tanks. And I mean, it is, it's incredible what happens and we can't believe this. But again, it, it, for, uh, for us, it's further proof that communism does not work and that the Western ideals do. Uh, the stealth bomber is finished, becoming the most sophisticated and advanced airplane in the world. The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles become a craze, I have written there. And that a craze, that's an understatement. The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were uh, Michelangelo, Leonardo, Raphael, and Donatello. Uh, they were turtles based on some of the great Italian Renaissance artists. Uh, and they were, it was a cartoon, and they made movies, and they had action figures and video games, and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles just was all, the, it, was, it was the stuff, uh, you know, for especially for, you know, kids that were, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13 years old kind of thing back then, because, um, you know, I, I have to admit, you know, this was when I was 12. I played the video games. I watched the movies. I watched the cartoon. It was great. And if you ask me, it's still great. So there you go. Uh, Millie Vanilli. You guys have probably never heard of the Millie Vanilli scandal, but this was something else. We laugh at it now. We think it's just ridiculous. But Millie Vanilli were a music group. It was two guys. And they their music went to the top of the charts. They were best-selling musicians. They, you know, um, had the dreadlocks, and they were, you know, this kind of Jamaican, you know, style, uh, almost reggae, rock, rap, you know, um, in, in some ways. And they, they were so popular. And um, it turned out that they had been lip syncing. They weren't really singing. Uh, they were lip syncing you know, during their choreographed dances and their performances, but they weren't the ones really singing. And it was all just a, a farce. It was all an act. And so this is, a, this is a big scandal when it comes out, right? That these guys could trick everybody and fool everybody into thinking they were the ones singing and, and their music was, you know, best-selling, but it wasn't really their music. It was other people singing uh, and they were just just mouthing or lip syncing the words. So that was crazy. And then Pete Rose, Major League Baseball's all-time hit leader, was banned from baseball in 1989 for having bet on baseball, which is a big no-no in the baseball world. If you're involved in professional baseball, you do not bet on professional baseball. Uh, it doesn't even matter if it's, if it's not your own team. If, if you're betting on any team, on any game, uh, that is strictly prohibited. And Pete Rose gets banned by the commissioner of baseball. And so for this reason, Pete Rose is, is still not in the Hall of Fame. Uh, his numbers, his statistics certainly merit him being in the Hall of Fame, but he is not in the Hall of Fame because of being banned for betting on baseball. And then also the Earthquake World Series in 1989, speaking of baseball. The Oakland Athletics and the San Francisco Giants uh, separated by the Golden Gate Bridge across the San Francisco Bay from each other, uh, play in the World Series and uh, in October of 1989. And before game three, the Oakland A's had won the first two games, best out of seven. So the first team to win four would win the World Series. And before game three, with Oakland leading two to zero in the series, an, uh, an earthquake hits the Bay Area and just is horrific. Uh, there are deaths. Uh, there is mass destruction in the area. Um, roads are torn apart. Bridges are twisted, uh, you know, like pretzels. And um, it was it was terrible. Uh, and so, you know, obviously baseball became secondary at that point, And they thought about maybe canceling the World Series. And then they decided in the end, you know, no, we'll, we'll play it, but we're going to take some time off. So they they took a week off while um, they tried to assess the damage and started to, started to try to fix some things. And, and people tried to, you know, in that area especially, tried to recover. Uh, and then after a week, uh, they resumed the World Series and the 
uh, Oakland A's won games three and four uh, to complete the sweep, and they won the World Series that year. But this will forever be known as the the Earthquake World Series because obviously uh, it was such a you know momentous and 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 just crazy event. So anyway, guys, that's the 1980s. And let me show you a couple pictures here before we finish up. Here's the Berlin Wall coming down. Of course, big celebration when people are allowed to come and bring their sledgehammers and their pickaxes and just start hacking away and, and taking chunks out of the wall, you know, keeping it for, for themselves as, as uh, you know, as mementos and, and it's pieces of history. Right. In fact, I, uh, I have a friend who was over uh, in the U.S. military. He was over in Germany at this time, and he was it was there when the Berlin Wall came down. He got some little pieces of it and, in fact, gave me one a number of years ago. So kind of cool. But, yeah, this was a huge celebration when it comes down because it's communism falling. And that's really what it represents. Here are the protests at Tiananmen Square. You can see the thousands of, it's, you know, a lot of younger kids uh, as well, relatively, right? Late high school to college age and just, just beyond college age, a lot of younger people in China who had grown up under this oppressive communist regime and they didn't want to live under that regime. They wanted the freedoms that they saw other people around the world enjoy. And simply for protesting, many of them get mowed down. And of course, the most famous picture, probably from the Tiananmen Square incident was the one on the right. Uh, how one person standing in front of four tanks, basically just saying, I'm not going to move. You're going to have to run me over if you want to get, get by me. And, uh, you know, it's kind of symbolic of, of the strength one person can have. Of course, it takes a lot of courage and guts to do something like that. But it's, you know, that, that has been, that picture has been used in countless posters and, and, uh, you know, all kinds of things since then to, to show the power of one. Here is the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles just amazingness, right? Here you go. There's kind of the classic picture on the left, and there's the movie poster on the right. And, uh, I mean, it was crazy. It was goofy. It was, you know, but uh, it was fun, too. The Ninja Turtles were great. And here's Pete Rose. Yeah, that was kind of shocking when he got banned from baseball. You know, he was a hero for a lot of people and uh, in baseball, but being banned for life. Uh, now, every time a new commissioner gets appointed in baseball, which is, you know, it doesn't happen very often, but every time a new commissioner is appointed, uh, Pete Rose petitions to get reinstated so he can get into the Hall of Fame. But until 2020, as of right now, when I'm making this presentation, uh, he has not been reinstated. So there you go.